Okay. Right. We're recording now. So you, everything's going live. Um, I'm just going to open the floor for questions. Uh, anybody might have any about the books, the class, anything that's come up since last meeting? I'm not seeing anything. No one's. I have a question. Sure. Um, I missed on Monday. So I was just wondering if there was anything that I should have been going over or anything I should have read. Yeah, well, this book that I'm holding here, it's not one of the required books, but there's a PDF file on uh, Blackboard for Kierkegaard. Uh, it's it's under course content. There's a Kierkegaard folder. And I don't really know how far we're going to get today. I'm hoping to get through the preface and the uh, uh, this section called attunement, but we'll see. We'll see how far we get. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about it if you, if you, you know, didn't do the reading because I'm pretty much going to go through the whole darn thing for the first few pages. Um, and I'm going to review a little bit of what we did last time. Um, also, for those of you, I'm sure you're probably not the, the only person who uh, is here for the first time. For those of you who are not here on the first day, this is the first semester I'm teaching this class. I'm teaching two sections of it on campus and one online. And because of that, I'm recording all these lectures. So I, I actually videotaped the meeting we had on campus on Monday. And so it's posted up on our Blackboard website. Um, so if you want to watch it, it's there. I think it's in the um, uh, course content uh, uh, link right at the top. Uh, these videos will be in the Kierkegaard folder. So if you click on the Kierkegaard folder, I'll put all, because we're going to start Kierkegaard today. So. I'll put all the Kierkegaard lectures in one folder and then we'll move on to Vonnegut and so on and so forth. But they're also available on YouTube. So if you go to my YouTube channel, Travis Ross, um, you'll probably be able to see them before I even get them up on Blackboard. You know? So I upload them to YouTube and then I put a link on, uh, on Blackboard. Sometimes I forget for a day or two. So <laughs> you can always find them on YouTube. Okay, anybody else have issues maybe finding the books or have any questions? Um, oh, you got you got the Kierkegaard book. Oh, wow, cool. Oh, awesome. Good deal. Good deal. Um, so, in fact, that's good because I, I don't know. We might actually cover more of it than I thought. I, I, I think I have up to page, uh, I think, page 71, which is really page 30-something because the introduction's so long. Um, so, I don't know. We'll see how we, – we might actually cover more of it um, than I planned. So, it's cool you bought the, the book. Uh, I might end up having to scan some PDF, uh, some more stuff for PDF, but you've got it. Anybody else have issues with anything? I don't think so, it looks like. Um, I have a question. Yeah. I'm sorry. No. Um, so uh, the book that we're reading right now, it's the Carn the Carnegard, I believe that's his. Yeah, it's a Kier <laughs> Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard, okay. So. Actually, I'm, I'm not even saying it right. It's supposed to be like Kierkegaard or something like that. But yeah. Okay. I, I think I, ha I was having a hard time looking for that one. Is it? it I just know that you posted um, part of it on um, on Blackboard. Right. And I believe. You don't need to get that one. You know, that what's, oh, okay. well, yeah, what's on Blackboard is all you need. I mean, Andrew got a copy. Good for him. I mean, I, I love to see people buying books. Um, but yeah, that one you don't really, the other ones are the ones you got to get copies of. Okay, thank even you. Those, even those I put on Blackboard, but I mean, I, I would suggest getting the, the physical copy because they're really long books. So, I mean, I don't know if you want to be reading a full, I mean, some kids, some young kids like that. I don't, I can't read book, books digitally, especially PDF files. Maybe if I have like one of those, yeah. if I have one of those fancy Kindle devices, maybe it might be different, but yeah. I would suggest buying the, the, the three books that are listed on the syllabus. But you won't need the first one, at least for the next few weeks, probably. Yeah. We're going to be on okay. Kierkegaard for at least a couple of weeks. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so like I said, I want to get to the reading, but before I do, let's, let's review a little bit of last lecture. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Where are we at? Here we go. These are the quotes we covered last time. 
and we don't really have to do this, but I kind of wanted to see if anybody, you know, had anything they wanted to add or say or any thoughts um, on these quotes. I'll read through them again, maybe give y'all a minute to gather your gather your thoughts. Let's read through these quotes again uh, and, and feel free to interject and interrupt me at any time. First one is from Kierkegaard, right? Our first philosopher. So this is the one, life can, be, uh, can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Uh, the, the sort of famous life is a mystery philosophy. As opposed to Alan Watts, the second quote, which is sort of like, it's not a mystery. Life's no big mystery. You're just making a big deal of it, right? What does he say? He says the meaning of life is just to be alive. It's so plain and so obvious and so simple, and yet everybody rushes around in a great panic as if it were necessary to achieve something beyond themselves, right? We were looking for some meaning in religion or some higher calling or some purpose when all it is is just being a good friend and a fan or whatever, just living your life and being a human. John Lennon, right? Life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans, right? Life is, we try to do all these things, we make all these plans and then life is just what happens along the way. Wittgenstein, we talked about him yesterday and I'm gonna kind of review him a little bit um, this time because I felt like um, I wasn't super clear about why I spent so much time on meaning. So I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to relate it to the class more, but this is the quote I gave y'all from Wittgenstein last time. Um, and we couldn't get the projector to work. This is kind of why I'm doing this because we weren't able to look at the quotes as we discussed them. So this is kind of a better format for this. Wittgenstein says, we feel that even if all possible scientific questions be answered, the problems of life have still not been touched at all. This is sort of the life is a mystery sentiment, right? Life is mysterious. Science can't really explain it. But then he kind of goes back on it and almost goes to the Alan Watts sentiment that, well, that means there's no question left and just this is the answer. The solution of the problem of life is seen in the vanishing of the problem. Nietzsche, this is the brutal, right? The brutal uh, conception of life. Um, or depending on how you read it, maybe it's not just, it's not brutal, but it's uplifting and it's, you know, inspiring. I guess it depends on how one reads it, but the, on the face of it, pre pretty brutal. What is life, Nietzsche writes. Life, that is, continually shedding something that wants to die. Life, that is, being cruel and inexorable against everything about us that is growing old and weak. And no, not only about us, life, that is then being without reverence for those who are dying, who are wretched, who are ancient, constantly being a murderer. This is another sentiment that you're gonna find that's common about you know, philosophies of life. You know, the first one we saw in the first quote, that life is a mystery, you can't understand it, you have to live it forwards, but you can only understand it backwards. Um, the Alan Watts sort of sentiment that you guys are just overthinking it, it's just obvious, just live. Uh, but then you've got this thing like life is tied to death. In order to live, other things must be destroyed. And the, the, the most vibrant life uh, lets these things sort of die, right? Um, not holding on to those things which are decaying, but yet moving forward to a more stronger, more, uh, you know, I guess more fully worked out future. I gotta say, I think the Picasso quote is my personal favorite. He says, and it's a nice short one. He says, the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. So. <laughs> what is it that you're good at? What are you here for, right? What are you special at? What can you do that no one else can do in a certain way that only you can do it? And how can you give that to others? How can you be a part of your community in a way that's significant and, and, and is fulfilling to yourself and helpful to others? I love this uh, Douglas Adams that the uh, answer to the ultimate question of life is 42, right? This is sort of a joke from uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. We get this, this is the answer to the meaning of life according to his uh, fictional supercomputer known as Deep Thought, who has the answers to everything, right? 
And then in the end, says Abraham Lincoln, in the end, it's not the years in your life that count. It's the life in your years, right? How, how do you spend your life? That's what gives it its vibrancy and its meaning. It's not how long you live, but what you do with the time allotted. Right? So anyway, we spent, I think, a lot of time on those in class last time, but I felt I'd give you all a chance to interject if you want to. Don't feel like you have to, but if anybody has any comments or questions or criticisms, I like criticisms. Any problems you have with these quotes? Nothing? No, nobody? All right. Well, um, let me actually get, I feel a, I feel a sneeze coming on. Uh, oh, geez. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Thank you. Let me get a new PowerPoint um, slide going here. And this often occurs when I flip between screens, sometimes you can't see it. So um, do you see the PowerPoint or do you guys still see the PDF file on your screen? The PDF of the quotes. Okay, well, all right, I gotta stop. Shift. PDF file, yeah. All right, let me, let me redo this then. Okay, so that should work. Okay, so now you should be able to see the PowerPoint. It's blank. But <laughs> You can see it. Let's see. So let's let's write a title here. Meaning of life. Last time we talked about a little bit, and I've really covered this briefly. I'm going to keep it kind of brief. We talked about, I guess, what the way I put it was the meaning of meaning. <laughs> And, and we talked about um, very briefly a couple of different kinds of theories of language. One that I'm not too happy with that is still a popular theory. So just because I don't like it doesn't mean it's not good. And then one that I'm going to operate under. Now, we talked about um, what was called, um, let me get a new slide going here. It's what's often referred to as referentialism. So this is a theory of language, a theory of meaning. It basically says that words, the meaning of the word is determined by its reference. What does it refer to? So the word uh, smartphone refers to this object, this, this, this physical thing that exists in, in the universe. And that's all language is. Language is a reference to the, the world. It, it, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the word and the object. And that's, that's all that meaning is, is a correspondence between the word and the object. There's a lot of problems with this theory. We talked about them last time, but one of them is the fact that um, words change, right? And um, that oftentimes there are words that have references to several things. And there's, sometimes there's words that don't really refer to anything. So what does the word meaning refer to? What object does meaning I mean, the word smartphone refers to this physical thing. The word book refers to things like this. The word bottle refers to things like this. I can point to a physical thing, but what, what do I point to when I use the word meaning? So referentialism kind of breaks down. I myself, as a philosopher of language, I prefer to take the approach of Wittgenstein. So we talked about Wittgenstein last class a little bit. I'll mention him again. And we'll go with his theory of language games. Right? Language works, but it doesn't work the way that the referentialist thinks so. It works a lot more like a game and a very loose game, a game whose rules change all the time. We adapt to different things. I think I use the, and I, I'm a horrible uh, um, person to do this because I, I, I never watch sports, but it, it, to me, it's the best example of the kind of game that I'm talking about. You know, basketball is a game where professional sports, the NBA, they're constantly changing the rules of the game. And the way, and the reason they do this is a reaction to how the game is played, how the rules are manipulated and what works and what doesn't work. And a similar thing goes on with language and the rules change. The meaning of words change. So we talked about the word game last time because Wittgenstein uses that as an example. 
think somebody else used the word lit, or I think I use the word lit. So it's always talking about, you know, slang, things like that. The word gay, right? All these words have different meanings in different time periods, uh, different cultures, etc. But the meaning for Wittgenstein is always the use. How is the word being used? And how the word is being used depends on a context. It depends on a context. And the context is inseparable from the word. So there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between the word game and some activity out there. But the word game takes on meaning based on how it's used in a particular context. I think, I think it was Deidre or somebody talking about, are you game for this? Are you game to go to the movie with me, right? Uh, you know, are you interested? Are you, you know, in the mood for that? I'm going to go hunting game, right? Don't play games with me. Uh, the guy has good game. Let's go um, watch the game. Let's go play the game. All these have different connotations. But for Wittgenstein, and I did mention this, there is a family resemblance amongst the uses of these words. And that's how we're able to understand what people mean oftentimes when they use words in unconventional ways. And so you might say that, that Wittgenstein takes a much more contextual approach to language and meaning than some other philosophers who take this sort of referential of, approach, right? Words have absolute meanings. There's a correspondence between the meaning of the word and the actual thing out there. And for Wittgenstein, it's a lot more loose than that. And that's the kind of approach that we're gonna have to take to meaning in this class, right? Because, well, when we talk about life in the context of a philosophy course, there's a lot of ways we could go with that. We could talk about life in a biological sense. We could talk about life as like my personal life. We could talk about, uh, you know, all sentience, anything that has uh, consciousness or sight or whatever. It's, there's a, a broad amount of spectrum of terminology. Uh, or, or use of that word life. When we ask about the meaning of life, and this is what I sort of ended class with last time, we asked about the meaning of life. Typically what we have in mind again is something more personal, more biographical. Why am I here? What is my purpose? Why do I exist? And what am I gonna make of my life? Or what, what do I do to be a good life, to have a good life? Um, or maybe we could broaden that and make it less subjective and less personal and just ask it generally, what is the meaning of life for all humans? Is there one answer to that question? Maybe each of us has to answer that on an individual basis. Certainly a philosopher like Kierkegaard would probably say something like that. He seems to be more of an individualist. But the point that I'm making here when it comes to meaning is though that the, the, the word life can have all sorts of different connotations and contexts. And when we ask for the, 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 we ask the question, what is the meaning of it? Uh, there are different ways that we can answer it. And I'm gonna try to touch upon as many of those as I can in the course of this semester through the readings that we've chosen. One that I think we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on though is the biological definition of life, right? Just the fact that anything that has a metabolism and breaks other life down Although I guess you could argue that that Nietzsche quote was a bit of a biological definition. And you might see something like a biological definition in some of the readings that we're gonna do. But I wanna talk about life, you know, and we're gonna see when we get to the readings that whether we're looking at the philosophical readings or whether we're looking at fictional readings, a couple of the books that we're reading are works of fiction, we're gonna be presented with different approaches to living. How different individuals might approach their life. And so that's the sort of meaning that we're looking for there. Here I am. We're all sort of stuck with this problem. Some of us don't see it as a problem. We sort of just, well, what do you mean? Just go get a job, get married, you loser, right? We take the sort of Alan Watts approach to life. But for Kierkegaard, in a way, that's a cop-out. You know, for Kierkegaard, the question of our existence is the most important one. It has the most weight. 
and all of our other decisions about life and all the other things and all the other choices that we make are predicated on that first ultimate question of how we're going to approach our existence. How are we going to exist? We have to take a stand. Even if we decide not to take a stand, that itself is taking a stand. Even if we decide, I'm just going to go with the flow, I'm not going to really worry about my life. I'm just going to sort of be a conformist and follow society. That itself is taking a stand on my condition. And, and ironically, Kierkegaard, you know, he once wrote that um, this is a question that can't be answered philosophically, and yet we can't really answer it without doing philosophy. And so it's a sort of catch-22. It's sort of a conundrum that we're in. And ultimately, we can never know for sure whether or not our approach to, to life is the correct one because we can't step outside of life and judge it objectively. But he said that there are, you know, we talked about this class class, that there are basically three ways that we can approach life. He called these the three stages on life's, way. So again, this is from Kierkegaard. It's not in your reading, but I think it's helpful to your reading because he does use this terminology uh, quite a bit in the reading. And so we talked about, you know, for him, <clears throat> there are basically three ways that a human being tries to approach existence. And the first one is the aesthetic approach, right? And when we approach life aesthetically, we see the world through the lens of boring and interesting, right? So things are either interesting or they're boring. That, that's how we value things. If they're interesting, we like them, we wanna get to them, we want more of them. If they're boring, they suck. Get out of my life, right? That's the aesthetic approach. We wanna have a good time all the time. We're looking for the next party, the next amusement. As we talked about this last class, we mentioned that this sort of life is ultimately unsatisfactory to most of us. We can kind of get a kick out of it for a while, but ultimately it leaves us with this feeling of emptiness. We start to feel like, geez, okay, that was fun, but what else? There's gotta be something beyond just sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There's gotta be something that has value besides just the value in the moment. So the aesthetic tends to have focus on the moment. What is happening now? And how can I enjoy the present without reflecting on it too much and just let go and let loose? But as I said, and as Kierkegaard argues, it's hard to maintain that. Eventually we kind of get burnt out and we want something more substantial. And this is when we usually turn to what he calls the ethical approach to life. And we start to see things in terms of good and evil, or good and bad, put evil in parentheses here. So we start to think, you know, I'm getting a little bit older now. I've been to enough parties. I've seen enough fun times. And I still want to have a good time. I'm not like a stick in the mud. But man, maybe I need to actually start to develop an actually meaningful relationship. You know, if I'm in the mode of the aesthetic, I'm not really thinking about meaningful relationships. I'm thinking about interesting relationships. So I might hang out with some people that are not really good people, but they're interesting. I might hang out with artists who are very selfish and self-centered, but they're artists, so they're interesting. Musicians that are like, prima donnas and they party all the time and they don't care about you and they just want to rock and roll but man it's fun to hang out with them so i don't really establish any deep meaningful long-term connections with people if i'm in that mode of the aesthetic but again that gets burnt out after a while i'm like jesus is a very empty existence then this leads to a sort of ethical approach well you know maybe i need to make something of myself Maybe I need to focus on my career and take my career more serious. You know, I'm a teacher. Uh, this isn't just a gig. I need to educate the future of America. Now I care about the children. And that's, that's, that's my form of the ethical. Kierkegaard, in his writings, when he talks about the ethical, he tends to use the example of marriage 
which I think is misleading because I think a lot of people misread him and they think that that's the only form of the ethical. Oh, when he says the ethical, he says, just get married and have a family. It's just, it's kind of the archetypal uh, version of the ethical. It's the more common one, right? When you start to get burnt out on living the party animal life, you start to think, man, I need to have something meaningful in my life. You start looking to relationships. Maybe I need to find a good woman to settle down with instead of all these party girls, you know? I need to find someone serious and mature, a nice girl, right? Like my mom used to say, when are you going to find a nice girl, right? I need to go find a nice girl, like mama said, right? Maybe start a family, right? Become a dad, that kind of thing. So this, at this point, you know, I actually have a strong sense of identity and I establish a sense of self, whereas the aesthetic that's not really that important. My sense of self is almost like a work that's always in progress. It's a work of art that I'm always working on and I'm not that attached to it. My identity could be, you know, I can shed it like, like the snake, <laughs> like a snake sheds its skin. It's kazoo type, whoever's sneezing. Um, right, so, you know, I think last time, I don't know if it was this class, but maybe my other class, I was sort of joking, right? Like, you know, if you're living the aesthetic life, you know, one week you're punk rock, the next week you're goth, the next week you're hip hop. It's just, you, you try on one identity, you get your fun out of it, you burn out, then you move on to the next trend or whatever. But the ethical is the opposite. You make a commitment. And that's why I think marriage is such a good example because, you know, when you make those wedding vows, you have a strong sense of what that means. You know, and every wife and every husband might have their own personal values for what, what, what is the perfect wife? What is the perfect husband? But they have that idea in their head and they wanna become that. They wanna maintain that, they wanna become that, and they wanna to stick to that sense of self. Unlike the aesthetic where they're not really that attached to their self. Again, their identity is something that they that morphs, that changes. It's always trying to be interesting, trying to avoid the boring. You know, there's a um, a book that Kierkegaard wrote called The Seducer's Diary, and he wrote it as if he were this guy um, who was a seducer. Right? He, he, he Kierkegaard does this a lot. I mentioned he he writes as other people. He takes on the persona of someone else and tries to sort of explore existence or life through 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 the, the lens of somebody else. But he gives us the example of this seducer um, who doesn't have a name, but he just has K, the initial K uh, is the seducer. And K basically seduces this young woman, but but he convinces her to marry somebody else, right? He convinces her to marry, uh, I think Johannes is the guy's name. He basically makes her fall in love with him very sneakily, right? He, by, by basically telling her, you know, you're a very nice young lady. Why haven't you found yourself a husband yet? She's like, I know, I don't know what the problem is. And he says, well, why don't you go with Mr. Johannes over there? He's such a nice young man. And she says, Johannes, yeah, he's nice, but he's kind of boring. And she's like, he's like, yes, but he'd be good for you. And, and basically he seduces this woman gets her to get engaged with another man. The night before they're about to get married, he professes his love to her, tells her, you know, he comes to her house and says, oh, Cordelia, I, I have to talk to you. And she says, what is it? What is it? What's wrong? And he says, I, wait, never mind. Forget it. Forget I even came over. I don't want to destroy your happiness. You and Johanna should get married and forget about me. Forget I ever came. And she's like, no, no, tell me what's wrong. And he's like, I, I'm sorry, but I love you. And I've always loved you. And I want to be with you, but I'm not good enough for you. You deserve him. And he's the right man for you. And she's like, no, no, you're right. I love you too. And, and so he sleeps with her. And then the next day he skips town and he never sees her again, right? Yeah, and you're shaking your head like, what a jerk, right? No, oh, what a dick, right? But, but, but for him, he did her a favor. He actually helped her, you know, because he's living the life of the aesthetic, 
before he before she met him, she was just a boring virgin maiden who was naive about the world. But now she's interesting, right? Imagine if she would have got married to boring Johannes. You know, they get married, they buy a house, they live happily ever after. I'm yawning, boring. I want to hear the story of the seducer who betrays her at the last minute. That's a good movie right there. So as far as he's concerned, he's done her a favor. He's made her more interesting, right? You see how this type of character, he doesn't have any attachments to friends, to career. It's all about setting things up so that they're as interesting as possible, you know? But the ethical, right, they have a very strong sense of what's right, what's wrong. That's not to say, though, that people who live this way are always what we would call ethical. That's what makes, I think, Kierkegaard's terminology somewhat confusing. Um, I think I use example of um, The Wolf of Wall Street, if you've ever seen that movie, right? You could argue that the character in that movie was living a sort of quote-unquote ethical life. He had a clear sense of what success was for him. I want to be this rich Wall Street tycoon. It's good to be rich. It's bad not to be rich. And anything that gets me towards that goal is good. Anything that gets me further from that goal is bad. Um, so, you know, typically when we think of things like the ethical, we think of things like marriage and our career or something that, you know, we have, but it could also be, you know, some pretty sleazy stuff as well. The point is you have some sort of system that you take to be universal. You take it to be this sort of system that you can apply to all aspects of your life. And it provides a sort of consistency to yourself. It, it provides a sort of consistency to your existence. Whereas the aesthetic doesn't want consistency because consistency is boring. And I guess that's the danger with the ethical, right? The danger with the aesthetic is that you get bored, or you, you get um, burnt out, you feel empty, you know, you, you party all the time, you're chasing tail, you, you're doing all this stuff. And at the end of the day, you're like, man, I have this empty existence, I need more meaning. So that's the trap you fall into with the aesthetic but there's also another trap with the ethical. Because it's so consistent, because it's so similar, boredom sets in. You know, it's hard to maintain that same fervor for your life. When you decide to get married, for instance, and you decide, I'm going to love you forever, till death do us part. It might be easy to do that for the first two or three years, but after a while, the marriage gets old, the marriage gets stale. Uh, you know, and it's hard to keep that love and to keep that fire. So time is sort of the um, the enemy to the ethical, uh, whereas this feeling of emptiness is the enemy to the aesthetic. And, and this is why Kierkegaard thinks that most of us spend our whole lives kind of oscillating between these two modes. We're either sort of less than what we should be. We're sort of these brute animals that just want to be in the moment and just have fun and party. We want to be some animal or we want to be more than what we are. We want to be some sort of God who creates laws and acts according to these laws that we ourselves create. But for him, there's a third possibility, a third distinct um, possibility. And this is what he calls the religious mode of existence. And he thinks that the vast majority of us will never really know what this is like. And he himself tried to be humble uh, as a writer, and he had his own doubts whether or not he had actually achieved faith, true faith, in his sense of that word. Because the dichotomy that we're left with when we see the world through the eyes of the religious is this dichotomy between having faith and being in despair. And so I'm not going to get into too many details about what he means by the religious. We'll give you sort of a starter here, but this is the main focus of the reading. In Fear and Trembling, that's the book that we're going to read selections from. In Fear and Trembling, um, 
Kierkegaard is writing as Johannes de Silencio, John the Silent. And he's trying to understand this mode of the religious through the example of Abraham from the Old Testament. And so when we get to the reading, we'll start to analyze this uh, the story from uh, Genesis, from the book of Genesis about Abraham. And in fact, I'll probably, what I should probably do is we should maybe even go to the Bible and read that short passage uh, before we jump into Kierkegaard. But let's talk a little bit. I, again, we're going to dive deep into the religious with this, this reading of his. But let's just uh, quickly, um, let's just, uh, let me say a few things to get us sort of started and give you an idea of what he might be talking about when he talks about the religious mode of existence. So faith, for Kierkegaard, faith is the opposite of despair. What despair means for him is the failure to be oneself. You're not being yourself. And he ironically thinks that almost all of us are in despair. And in fact, he believes that this is one of the, pro the problematic features of the modern era of modernity. He believes that our society, since the Industrial Revolution, since the Scientific Revolution, since modernity has set in, that it's made us more and more in despair, more and more incapable of being who we truly are. And this seems kind of ironic because it seems like, how could you fail to be what you are? Like, aren't you just what you are, whether you want to be or not? But obviously what he means by this is something deeper than that. He thinks that there is something about us that's true and that we covered up that truth. We cover up that truth with lies. We cover up that truth with some false self, a false sense of what we really are. And this is despair. So faith is to be oneself. One way that he defines it is that he says you are transparently grounded in the power that established you. So let me write that down. I guess we could use this as a sort of tentative definition for faith. This is not in your reading. This is in one of his other books. Uh, the sickness unto death. But let me give you, this is his formulation there. For, for, there he says, you know, faith is to be transparently, I can't spell transparent, transparently grounded in the power that established For Kierkegaard, this is equivalent to establishing a relationship to God. And for him, God and what God means and my relationship to God is completely unique to me. There is no way to universalize that relationship. And this actually goes for every relationship that I have, ultimately. For Kierkegaard, this relationship that I established with God is, for him, the most significant. But any relationship that I establish with any other person is always unique to me. This is one of his criticisms of modern philosophy. He mentions a philosopher named Hegel, and we'll get to that later when we dive into the reading. But he talks about how you know people like Hegel they tend to think about relationships, like the relationship between the father and the son, the relationship between the mother and the son, the relationship between a brother and an older brother, the relationship between a king and a subject. People like Hegel, they tend to think of these relationships in universalistic terms. How do I define the relationship between the son and the father? It goes by X, Y, and Z qualities. But Kierkegaard is here to say that, no, sure, there are things you can list. You know, you can talk about, well, 
everybody has a father. What does that mean? Well, it means that somebody was, you know, the male part of your birth, right? The one that provided the seed that eventually became you. That's universal. But as far as how you understand your father, how you relate to your father, the experiences that you had as a child growing up, or the lack of experiences, maybe you didn't have your father in your life, these are all unique to you. So you can't put some universal category, fatherhood, down on paper and then understand everybody's relationship with their father. This is what philosophy tries to do, says Kierkegaard, and it always fails. Every relationship is unique. And so my relationship to God is just like this. It's unique. And that's why he was very much opposed to organizing, <laughs> even though Kierkegaard himself, you know, he was a, you know, what you might call a Christian philosopher, uh, you know, he was religious. He did not like the church. He did not like organized religion. In fact, he once said that the, the church represents everything that Jesus came here to, to, uh, to rally against, to rebel against. And so um, for him, when we live a religious life, it's deeply personal. It's not being in despair, but actually being who we truly are to be transparently grounded in the power that established us. And for him, that's God. The power that established us is God. To be transparently grounded, what do you think that means? Transparent, you can see through it. It's easy to see. It's not fuzzy. What does it mean to be grounded? How would you explain that, to be grounded? more of like self-reserved of like keeping things to yourself um i i would say maybe not self-reserved is not the right word it's more like you are self-assured self-assured self uh, confident confident is a good word you know there's you're clear in your purpose right you have a you're very grounded right you know what what you should do and you're going to do it and it's clear so that's for him faith, is that you're grounded, and not only are you grounded, but you're grounded in the power that established you. You have this relationship to God that is clear. And so it gives you this clear sense of purpose of what the right thing to do is. So it's not exactly the ethical. You're not making this law for yourself. <clears throat> and it's not the aesthetic either, where you're just sort of going with the flow. You have a purpose, you're grounded, it's transparent, it's clear, but it's not something you established yourself. It's something that was, it's a calling, you might say. It's a calling. And this is why he picks the example of Abraham. He thinks that Abraham in the Bible, he had a calling, right? He was called upon to be the father of many nations, to be the father of faith, etc. Now, you know, I'm not religious, I'm not a Christian myself, so you know, try not to get too... I mean, I know there's probably a lot of people in here that aren't. So try not to get too distracted by that. I still think that this is a great reading, whether you're Christian or not. The story that he uses of Abraham, you know, whether it actually happened or not, or whether it's just a myth or a parable, I think is ins insignificant. It's still a very good story, uh, an interesting story uh, to analyze um, and to try to understand this, this um, phenomenon of faith. You know, if there is such a thing as faith, what is it? You know, what does it mean to live a life of faith? And how is Abraham an example of that, right? And, and, and what would that really be like, truly be like? How is it different from the ethical? So that's what we're going to try to draw out of the reading. Uh, and hopefully maybe even some more, right? I don't want to limit it to that, but that's sort of my, my focus here. Um, let me look up. I know I have a copy of the Bible in my I was going to... Did you want to say something? Would, would it also compare to being, um, I would say, like, your faith is almost like how much you trust in something or someone. Is that correct? I think so, yes. Um, I think, I don't know. I mean, the word trust might be slightly misleading, but I think it's appropriate. Misleading. Well, I think okay. it's, appropriate. it's appropriate because 
when you look at um, when we get to the reading, mm-hmm. you got to understand that that when Abraham is walking up the mountain, mm-hmm. you have to sacrifice Isaac. Mm-hmm. He does this with fear and trembling, right? So he's obviously he doesn't know what the future holds, but yet, right. but yet he trusts God. Right. So I think you're right. I think that faith, you know, once we have it, it's a sort of like. The reason I say trust is misleading is because we might. Or could, or could I say that it's almost like uh, ahead, it's ahead. almost like a mother nurturing a child from childhood up into they grow into their own self? Maybe that would be a good example. Maybe so. I think too that like <laughs> even a mother though, it's like. I think trust is too, like, it's too restrictive because it's almost like, right. I don't, maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm being too hard on you because I'm thinking like, when I think I trust somebody, it's like, I kind of know they could be wrong, but I'm going to, right. I'm going to trust them anyway. So like, right. I, I know there's a chance that they could be wrong, but I'm like, you know, I'm going to take this chance. Whereas okay. I, think, I think for Kierkegaard, you, you've even gone a step further than that, where it's like, mm-hmm. you don't even have any doubt. Like, you're like, you know, it's a possibility they're going to screw you over, but like, like that possibility is like not even on your radar anymore. You've really okay. given yourself up so much to that, that you don't even mm-hmm. care about that possibility. I think maybe right. the mother is maybe a good example of that. If you have that maternal instinct, you know, it's not something that really you lose, you know, you don't just right. decide one day to have it. It's not based on reflection. It's just this sort of direct like I know I'm a mom and like I gotta I gotta nurture my baby, you know, I gotta do right. my baby. And a lot of times what that entails is something that might not even be reasonable. You might do stuff that's right, right. reasonable for your baby. <laughs> um I thought I had a copy of the uh the Bible in my Google Docs, but I don't. So sorry, give me a second. I'm gonna look up uh Okay. I know they got a free version online, so the uh new revised standard version. And I'm I'm gonna I'm just looking for this passage from Genesis. Um, <laughs> now, if you read the uh, King James version, um, it's gonna be different, right? I picked the um, the New Revised Standard version because it's a right. little bit more accurate. But so basically, um, the old the, the old King James it, it may have something similar, but the King James is like a more updated version. Well, King James is a more literary. Like King James is actually easier to read. It, it's okay. It sounds nicer. It sounds right, right. And, and, so, <laughs> and, and, and most Christians, when they when they quote the Bible, especially in America, it's the King James. And so, like a lot right. of the, uh, the, the the sort of phrases and stuff. But this, the New Revised Standard Version, is a more like technical, academic, you know. Mm-hmm. So let's see here. I'm 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 on Genesis. Let me share my screen with you so you can at least watch okay. me while, while I'm scrolling through all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. Share screen. Okay, so I'm in Genesis. Let me go to God, uh, heavens and earth, count of Noah, Shem, Abraham, son Ishmael, Isaac. Okay, here we go. So let's find the passage. It's loading. No, I didn't mean that. Let's see. It's I should have done this before class. Sorry. I'm 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 about to like go to my bookshelf and just go pick up my freaking Bible. Abraham's father of Isaac. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Wow, this is too short. They like it's like one verse at a time. Forget this. I'm gonna I'm gonna grab my Bible real quick. Give me a sec.
Okay. So let's see here. So we're at about like 25, chapters 25. Um, okay, I, I'm too far ahead, actually. That's what messed me up. So this is uh, this is actually 2022. It's chapter 22 is where it starts. So let me actually look for that. Genesis chapter 22. And I don't care what version I get. Let's just try to find a, a full version here. Okay, so here we go. Let me read the passage where, uh, yeah, so the reason I'm reading this though, because some of y'all might not have got to the reading yet. This is a very short passage from the Bible and he's gonna write a whole book on it, right? Like, I mean, Kierkegaard's gonna like really analyze it. So you don't get a lot from the biblical story. Um, and, and that's why that's part of the mystery. You know, how do we explain uh, in, in, in terms that make sense or, or can we explain in terms that make sense this episode from the Bible, right? What does it say about faith? And so, uh, again, this is chapter 22 from Genesis, the book of Genesis. And he says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withhold, withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up. And there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said on the Mount of the Lord, it will be provided. So that's the basic episode from the um, Old Testament, from the book of Genesis that Kierkegaard is going to analyze here. And for some of you who are not familiar with the Christian tradition, if this is the first time you're hearing the story, it might be kind of crazy, shocking to you. Yeah, I remember the first time I heard it. I was like, what the hell? What? <laughs> and, and usually um, Christians will say, well, it was just a test. You know, God was not going to kill Isaac. He knew all along. He was just testing Abraham. But then you're like, yeah. But Abraham was willing to do it. Like, he thought he was going to kill his son. That's messed up. <laughs> you know, is that, that's, you know, and this is what I kind of like about Kierkegaard is he doesn't sugarcoat it. He's very direct about it. He's like, yes, there is no way to justify this action. The only way to understand it is through faith. And so we, to analyze faith, for him, it's very instructive to analyze this story of Abraham. So, I thought I saw somebody about to jump in. Does, does somebody want to say something? Because I, I I, I'm about to read 
from the book. How much time do we got? We got 15 minutes? All right. Let me, um, let me get to the reading. Would it be appropriate to say that Abraham, uh, when he took, when, when Abraham went with his father about the lamb situation, was that a way of his dad enticing him the power of God or showing him that there is a higher power? Maybe. That's Maybe. a possibility? Yeah, po possibly. Yeah. I think ultimately um, what Kierkegaard and there's different ways of interpreting this reading, but I mm -hmm. think ultimately it seems like uh, he's, he centers his analysis around the character of Abraham. Okay. And he tries to get her in the psychology of Abraham. Mm -hmm. And it seems more like to me that the person that learns in this ordeal is really Abraham. And, and, right. that, and that through this trial, through mm -hmm. fear and trembling, Right. Uh, as he walks up the mountain, that's when he gets his faith, right? That's when okay. he actually learns what his purpose is, right? That's right, when he, right. he gets transparently grounded in the power that established him. Because okay. I, I guess, I don't know if I said this last time, I think I said to my other class, um, we don't know what he was thinking. Right, going up right. That mountain. <laughs> but we know what he wasn't thinking about. Right. Right. He, pr he probably wasn't thinking about whether his favorite football team was going to win this season. And he, right. wasn't, and he wasn't worried about whether he was going to be able to get a nicer truck than his neighbors or something like that. He, he wasn't, right. thinking, he wasn't all that stuff, all that shit that he thought he cared about mm -hmm. all of a sudden doesn't matter. Now he realizes, Oh my goodness, I'm being called upon to murder my son. Oh my, what the fuck? Yeah. You know? Right. Right. And now, right. And now I've got to take <laughs> stock of my life, and I've got to really think about what I care about, and and I feel it. It's not mm -hmm. me, you know. It's not me sitting here thinking, you know, what do I care about? Let me make a list of you know, you know, rainbows and moonbeams and puppy dogs. You know, like you know, I love all oh, those things matter to me. Um, sure, but are they the thing that gets you up in the morning? Uh, are, are they what get you out of bed in the morning? Um, what what makes you tick? And I think that discovering that is, is part of it. And, and I think for him, and this is kind of um, maybe a bit frightening, um, and, and maybe this is why he claims that none of us hardly ever get to this point, most of us live our lives without faith, is it requires us to, to go through an ordeal and to experience uh, this loss. And it's very unsettling. So, um, you know, there's a common sentiment amongst religious people that your religion is a, um, it helps alleviate stress, right? That when you have faith, it makes your life easier. Oh, if you just turn your life to God, he will solve your problems, right? You know, Christians often say, just accept Jesus into your heart and everything will be good, you know? But Kierkegaard does not agree. Right. He's a Christian. He says no. So he's going to argue that, yes, he, he thinks maybe the, the religious life is the most meaningful. It's the most intense, but it's certainly not the easiest. In fact, it might be the most difficult uh, because it's such a personal um, thing. You might be called upon to do something that you can't justify to others. You, there's no way you could tell others why. You know, if, if you're a mother, right, you might do something for your children that you know no one else will agree is right, but you're just, I've got to save my kids, right? I'll, I would murder for my children. I would murder for my wife or my whatever, right? You know it's wrong. You know it's not ethical, but you still know that this is, if this is so important to me, this gives my life such purpose that I, I know I can't justify it universally but i still believe it and i still live it and this is faith so um this quote this sort of epigram <laughs> that the reading starts with is is rather mysterious like much of the reading right he quotes haman saying what tarkin 
uh, the proud said in his garden with the poppy blooms was understood by the sun, but not by the messenger. This is a reference to, um, you know, Tarquin, who sent one of his messengers to his, his uh, son, who is in enemy territory. They wanted to conquer the enemy. So he told the messenger to go when he says, go to my son. When you see him, tell him I have a message for him. And what you need to do is take your sword and go to all the poppy plants in the garden and cut off the heads of all the tallest poppy plants. And the messenger was like, that's your message? Just tell him to, oh, okay, I'll do it. So the guy goes and, and he says, hey, your dad has a message for you. He says, oh, really? What's the message? And he goes and does it, cuts off the, the and the poppy plants. Oh, I get it. The messenger didn't understand it. The son understood it. What he was saying was, kill all the people in charge, right? Cut the heads off of all those who are ruling, right? So, I don't know. I'll leave it at that. This is this epigram is supposed to somehow uh, relate to the reading, right? So maybe there's a message that God sent to Abraham, and it was only understood by Abraham, but not by us or or those who gave the message. I don't know. But let's let's read the preface here. Let's read the preface, and let me let me try to zoom in a bit, make it a little bit bigger there. So, what do we get here first, right? We get this sort of introduction. We don't even know who's writing it yet, okay? At least we're not supposed to. We're going to find out at the end of the preface that it's Johannes de Silencio, and that becomes important in a, in a, later on. He says, not just in commerce, but in the world of ideas, too, our age is putting on a veritable clearance sale. Everything can be had so dirt cheap that one begins to wonder whether in the end anyone will want to make a bid. Every speculative scorekeeper who is conscientiously or who conscientiously marks up the momentous march of modern philosophy, every lecturer, crammer, student, Everyone on the outskirts of philosophy or at its center is unwilling to stop with doubting everything. They all go further. It would perhaps be mal a propos to inquire whether they think that where, where, where they think they're going. Though surely we may all in all politeness and respect take it for granted that they have indeed doubted everything. Otherwise, it would be odd to talk of going further. This preliminary step is one they have all done, all of them taken, and presumably with so little effort as to feel no need to drop some word about how. For not even someone genuinely anxious for a little enlightenment on this will find such not a gesture that might point him in the right direction, no small dietary prescription for how to go about such a huge task. But Descartes did it, didn't he? A venerable, humble, honest thinker whose writing surely no one can read without being most deeply stirred. Descartes must have done what he has said and said what he has done a rare enough occurrence in our time. Descartes, as he himself repeatedly insists, was no doubter in matters of faith. But we must keep in mind what has been said, that we must trust to this natural light only so long as nothing contrary to it is revealed by God himself. Above all, we should impress on our memory as an infallible rule, that what God has revealed to us, incomparably more certain than anything else, and that we ought to submit to the divine authority rather than our own judgment, even though the light of reason may seem to us to suggest with the utmost clearness and evidence something opposite. So that, that, that parentheses that he just gave 
was a quote from Descartes. So for those of you not familiar at all with Descartes, for those of you who maybe have, are taking philosophy for the uh, first time, maybe this is your first um, philosophy class, let's talk a little bit about some of the jargon here. He says that um, modern philosophy stops at doubting. Or wait, modern philosophy refuses to stop at doubting. It always goes further. It actually starts with doubt. And yet, Johannes de Silencio, the man who was apparently writing this, he seems to question the sincerity of this doubt. He seems to question the sincerity, not the sincerity of Descartes' doubt. He thinks that Descartes actually did doubt. He says that Descartes said what he did and did what he said. So if you ever read Descartes' meditations, right, meditations on first philosophy, Descartes is often referred to as the father of modern philosophy. And so many philosophers who come after him, even though they disagree with him, they often start where he starts. They start with doubt. So again, if you've never read the meditations in, in very brief, Descartes is meditating. He's meditating on what he knows. Why is he doing this? Why is he thinking about what he knows? He's living during a time in which all the things that thought were thought to be true are becoming undermined. All the scientific truth, we're having scientific revolution. The church is being challenged by Martin Luther. So all these universal truths about the universe, things like you know, our place in it, are being undermined. And so Descartes is, he's completely shook up about this. And so he develops this sort of skepticism. And for Kierkegaard, he says, this is sincere. This is a sincere doubt. This guy really lived through life. And he's like, man, I, I thought, and, and it's not that this stuff was by idiots. Like people like Aristotle were, were geniuses, but they were wrong. They thought the earth was in the middle. They thought all these things that were wrong. So he's like, man, I don't want to make this mistake. And so he begins with this sort of hypothesis. What if it's all a lie? What if everything's an illusion? What if everything is just fake? And my whole life is a dream. And there's some evil genius who's got me trapped in some sort of matrix or something like that. He really sort of entertained that possibility. But Kierkegaard thinks that he really did this. Whereas modern philosophers that follow him, for them, it's just a philosophical exercise. They're like, well, we're going to maintain this sort of skeptical attitude. And the reason we're going to do it is to be rigorous, right? We're going to be like Descartes. We're going to doubt everything unless we can prove it with a really good knockdown argument, okay? With evidence, with reason. The only thing that we're certain of is that we exist, right? It says Descartes. I think, therefore, I, I am. So they all start with their sense of a self, right? I'm a self, Descartes says, I'm a thinking thing. I don't know anything else. Everything else could be an illusion. How do I get out of that corner that I painted myself into? Well, I do with philosophy. I do with reason. I, I do it with all these other things. So this is sort of the um, approach of modern philosophy. They start with doubt, and they work their way out to certainty. I'm out of time, unfortunately. But Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard's gonna, he's going to contrast this with the Greek philosophy, with the philosophy before Descartes, that doesn't start with doubt. It starts with wonder, with this sort of curiosity. 
wow, we live in this world. There are all these things that are true. What else can I know? But he thinks with the beginning of the modern period, this sort of skepticism and this sort of doubt seeps in. And this is a problem for faith. We're going to have to return to this. I was hoping we would at least get through the preface today, but unfortunately we didn't. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Let me push the stop button. But I'm going to leave the meeting open for a few more minutes in case anybody wants to stick around with questions. But otherwise, you guys, y'all have a great weekend, and I will see you on campus on Monday.